It's the Farmer to Farmer podcast, episode 88, and this is your host, Chris Blanchard. My guests today, Lily Schneider and Matt McHugh, raised 15 acres of vegetables at Shooting Star CSA in Fairfield, California, just 35 miles from Berkeley on the edge of the Central Valley. Along with four employees, they provide vegetables for a 250-member CSA plus three farmer's markets. Matt and Lily have a couple of unique twists on their CSA operation, making the unusual choice in their area not to operate year-round, as well as to focus on guiding members towards purchasing a full season rather than a monthly share. We dig into these choices as well as their histories before starting their own farm, how they found land and why they've chosen to stick with leasing, how they've worked to distinguish their CSA program from box schemes, and how they use field preparation, bed layout, and a couple of cool tools to stay on top of the weeds. We also discuss Lily's history in conventional agriculture and Matt's in the military and the Peace Corps. I enjoyed getting to know Lily and Matt, and I know you will too. Thanks for joining us. The Farmer to Farmer podcast is made possible with the generous support of Vermont Compost Company, founded by organic crop growing professionals committed to meeting the need for high quality compost and compost based living soil mixes for certified organic plant production. VermontCompost.com. This episode of the Farmer to Farmer podcast is brought to you by BCS America. BCS two wheel tractors are versatile, maneuverable in tight spaces, lightweight for less compaction, and easy to maintain and repair on the farm. Gear driven and built to last for decades of dependable service. BCSAmerica.com. Lily Schneider and Matt McHugh, welcome to the Farmer to Farmer podcast. Glad to be here. Hello. Thanks so much for joining me today. Really glad you could make this work. I mean, it's it is still farming season out there in California, right? Uh, yes, it is. We're still farming. We're still uh, doing the uh, the farming thing. Yeah. So if we could just start off today by having you kind of give us the lay of the land at Shooting Star CSA, where you guys are located, how big your farm is, how you're marketing, kind of all of that good farmer stuff. Yeah, so we're located in Fairfield, California, which is um, kind of halfway in between Sacramento and San Francisco. So we're on the edge of the Central Valley. It gets pretty hot here, but we also get some afternoon breezes because we're kind of closer to the Delta and the Bay. And we have, so we farm 15 acres here and we do a CSA and then we also do some farmer's markets. And the CSA is about 250 members, weekly members, and um, it kind of fluctuates throughout the season. And then we do three farmers markets um, every week, and we're seasonal, so we go, we start in May and we go all the way through like Thanksgiving. No winter production then. No, no winter production. We're um, pretty much seasonal right now, and we've we've tried really hard not to do any farming in the winter because we really like having our winters off. There's definitely farming in this climate is there's a lot of pressure to go year round. And so um, it's been it's definitely been uh, we've had to say no a lot to, to people about farming in the winter. But we actually think that our CSA customers really appreciate it because everyone says they want to eat more vegetables in the winter. But then maybe they don't want the, you know, rutabaga, parsnips, uh, cabbage, all that stuff, you know, week after week. So we're actually we think we're doing we're we're doing them a little bit of a favor by giving them a break from the weekly boxes in the winter. And so Fairfield, you said, are kind of on the edge of the Central Valley. How far are you guys away then from the Bay Area? We're actually about, we're 35 miles from Berkeley. Uh, and so we consider ourselves uh, pretty much as local as, uh, as far as our climate, to have a warm enough climate to grow tomatoes and all the warm season stuff. Uh, we're pretty much as local as they uh, as they get. Really, we're as local as you can, we're just about as local as you can get, and still have that really warm season climate. Um, yeah, we kind of we really worked really hard to to kind of have the perfect combination of uh, good soil, um, ample access to water with Swan Irrigation District, uh, and access to markets. And uh, you know, it's kind of like the perfect combination. It's worked out really well for us. So being 35 miles from Berkeley, are you guys subject to development pressure or are you guys solidly in ag country there? We have a, we're kind of in a, in the Susan Valley is a section that uh, is currently solidly in ag production. Uh, And, you know, development, I mean, I'm sure there is people who spend many, many hours a year trying to figure out ways to um, convert the zoning of the Sassoon Valley into residential. <laughs> uh, 
So we're, we're pretty we're pretty sure about that. And the pressure has a lot of different things. Say, you know, it's a nice, beautiful area. So if just by the act of a bunch of people riding bicycles down the road, really, and looking at the beautiful area, will uh, probably increase land values. Just doing that alone will. Um, and so, yeah, that, that's that's a whole other thing altogether. Yeah, but as far as land prices, definitely in that respect, like I think Fairfield is, we're on the outskirts of the Bay Area, but we are considered part of the Bay Area. So there are a lot of, um, Fairfield's about 100,000 people, a lot of people commuting into Oakland, Berkeley, San Francisco, people commuting to Sacramento. So it's, um, there's just a lot of people everywhere around here. It's not like some other parts of California where you can kind of drive forever and just go to a little small town, but we're, there's a lot of houses going up, not right in our valley, but it's there's just it's it's something that we kind of you know deal with all the time. And then most of your marketing is in the Bay Area, right? We have customers all over the Bay Area, um, basically um, Fairfield, um, you know, up and down the 680 corridor. Uh, Berkeley and uh, San Francisco. You guys are kind of on the cusp between being a relatively new farm and a really well-established operation. You started farming in 2009, right? That is correct. Uh, I guess uh, almost eight years. So tell me about getting started in 2009. Best way to describe it is uh, is kind of uh, I, I kind of felt like a uh, post-apocalyptic scavenger uh, looking for pieces <laughs> and uh, vans and things like that, and it was great because we were kind of sifting through the ruins of the uh, Great Recession. It was pretty, actually kind of a good, in terms of acquiring equipment, it was a really good time. Had you been farming before you started Shooting Star CSA or before you got to your current piece of property? We both, um, so Matt and I met at the UC Santa Cruz Organic Farm back in 2006. Um, not For those of the listeners that aren't familiar with that, they have a six-month training program in ecological horticulture and the apprentices come and they live on the farm. It's a really, really neat program. So we met back in 2006 and then um, I was still finishing up school, and then I I worked on a couple of farms, got a farm manager job in 2008, and Matt um, went and did the Peace Corps in Africa, in Niger, and then he came back and also got a farm manager job. So we both had these different jobs managing farms for other people. That was a really, really good experience. But at the end of that year, we both decided that we didn't really feel like we wanted to work for other people anymore. We were ready to kind of have our own business and start our own thing. So we definitely had a good amount of experience going in. And I think that that's probably one of the reasons that we've been so successful is because We've, you know, worked, we had worked for a lot of different farmers, seen, you know, different size operations, uh, mistakes that people had made, and then being able to be a farm manager on a different, like on a farm that we didn't own, it was kind of all the mistakes that we made, they were on someone else's dime. So, um, you know, it was just a really good learning experience to see things that worked, things that didn't work, but also have some responsibility and kind of be able to, uh, make our own decisions. So then going and starting our own farm, we kind of, we had worked out, you know, some of the things that I think I see people working through in their first couple of years who don't have a lot of experience farming. So I think that that kind of allowed us to have a leg up. When you say you, you had a leg up on some of the things that you see a lot of other folks struggling with in their first couple of years, like what? Um, the thing that comes to mind immediately is just like really basic things like weeding you know we're really really into killing weeds and just the idea that like if the, if the weeds if the weeds are like big enough that you can see them from across the farm then you already kind of made a really big mistake you want to get them when they're really tiny and you know it's a lot less work so that's that's one example. Matt, can you think of another example? Well, there's yes, yeah, if you're if you're bending over then you're losing money. Uh, Another thing to really think of is uh, on the marketing side, um, overproduction, underproduction, <laughs> trying to get, you know, trying to essentially match uh, your production to the to your markets. Uh, I think it's something that's just they're, they're the only way you can do it is by making a mistake, essentially, um, and kind of 
you know, honing in and it just takes a long time to calibrate yourself to whatever markets you're, you're in, um, you know, or increase the markets, uh, you know, or increase your production. Um, and so it's, it's just a long process to figure all that stuff out. Uh, how much really, how much to plant essentially is the real question. How much are you going to produce from what you plant and how much of that are you going to be able to sell and what percentage of crops are you willing to, you know, not be able to sell after you've produced them. So that's, uh, I think those are some actually some some pretty nuanced uh, decisions that, that take uh, that take some time to really just to work out in any any business, any agricultural business. Yeah, and we always say that we have this saying, which is that you can be a bad farmer, but you can't be a bad marketer, which kind of translates to. <laughs> Farming, the growing of the crops is not necessarily the hard part, but the selling of them is very can be very challenging. And so, um, it's it's really important to be able to grow beautiful, high quality produce. But if you don't have anywhere to sell it, then it's kind of like maybe you didn't you weren't really that successful in the end. So we we really try to to do a good job with marketing and with growing. Was that a consideration in the location of your farm? Did you guys shoot for a place that was close to the Bay Area and maybe pay a little bit more for it with the idea that that, that would make your marketing easier? Well, access to markets is really important, um, of course, uh, but I don't want to give the impression that um, that we're – I mean, we looked for land all around, uh, and so it, it just kind of – really the reason why we're here is – it just kind of worked uh, across the, across the street from where we are. We were going to be at a, 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 a field across the street, and it fell through. And we were kind of, you know, running out of time um, in early 2009. Uh, and you know, we'd started a bunch of <laughs> a bunch of plants in a friend's greenhouse, and like, oh, this piece of land fell through. What are we going to do? And we just kind of looked across the street and. Uh, and there was our future farm, and we just knocked on the door. Um, you know, there's no, there's no internet involved. Uh, there, there's no database. We just kind of ended up seeing good soil and knocking on the door. Um, and that's really what I encourage all uh, people getting into agriculture to do, rather than relying on. You know, instead of relying on databases looking for people who may be interested in leasing land, um, and, and just you know, instead of cruising the internet, um, if you're going to cruise the internet, cruise the Web Soil Survey, find the good soil and, and that's in a close enough proximity to um, your market, and just you know, literally, you know, boot scoot around and knock on doors. Uh, as soon as people you know put their shotguns down, they, they tend to be really friendly. <laughs> So, so you literally just went and knocked on the door at this farm. And who answered the door, and what did they say? Uh, our, our Roger, uh, he, uh, our Lana, our Lana Reed and Roger were both there, and uh, he actually answered the door in the funniest way. He he just he said uh, he said he said this one single word. He said what. <laughs> And we started talking to him, and it turned out to be really, uh, you know, really nice. And literally in one week, uh, it turned out they had done uh, they had done walnuts uh, a few years ago. Uh, they pulled them out um, for three years, I think three or four years before we uh, arrived, um, and they had just been disking the, the, the field once or twice a year. So they're ready for something different. They're kind of tired of um, just disking it, um, and so it just kind of. It was kind of serendipitous, I guess. It was, uh, um, but also it's kind of like you have to create serendipity for yourself. You know what I mean? And that's the thing. I, I think I think a lot of farmers, especially when you're getting started, us and our friends were like, "Oh, well, you got this piece of land, or you got that piece of land," and you assume that person that, that managed to acquire that piece of land had some kind of luck or uh, privilege or whatever. But the truth is, sometimes you just have to just create that experience that serendipity for yourself and uh, and give yourself a chance and that's why it really comes down to getting that face to face time with people. I guess it's the same way with marketing really when you first start out too. And are you guys renting that land now or did you purchase it? We lease it. Uh we lease it. The land prices are, you know, definitely <laughs> definitely up there in, in this area. So it would be it'd be kind of a big deal for us to buy anything in the Sassoon Valley. Um and when you think about it it's 
for the most part, it's cheaper in every single way imaginable to lease land uh, than it is to purchase land. Um, and do you have a long-term agreement? I mean, we've been around doing it for eight years. We we have a we have an agreement. Yes. <laughs> I know a lot of people, a lot of beginning farmers who are thinking about leasing land versus buying land are concerned about all of the expense that can go into developing the infrastructure on a farm, and especially a vegetable farm where you need things like a packing shed. It's it's different than a corn and bean operation or even than a livestock operation. Have you guys had to build some of that infrastructure on the farm? In terms of infrastructure, there was already a barn here that we could use as a packing shed. We've It had a lot of old walnut processing equipment in there that over the years we've um, cleaned out, so we have a lot more space than we used to. Besides that, um, at least for our first couple of years, we did very, very little in terms of infrastructure because we already had uh, access to the Solano Irrigation District, which uh, pulls water out of Lake Berryessa. It's a reservoir up in the hills. And so we got we had our irrigation district water, and then we did build end up building a greenhouse. Now we actually have two greenhouses, but... Besides that, things were very set up because we're in a, such an agricultural region. You know, even on a property that hadn't been farmed in a number of years, the fact that it had been farmed in the past, it means that there are certain things that are already, already going to be there. So we had our, you know, where the water comes out of the ground from the irrigation district. Um, there was a domestic well that we could wash the veggies with. And um, electricity was already here. So uh, it wasn't too much of an issue for us getting started. Since then, we had we did drill a ag well uh, a couple of years ago so that we can have more water in the winter because our irrigation district goes from April through October. So in the winter months, if we need to water, we can do that now with our with our ag well. But that drilling a well, at least in our valley, wasn't too much of a big deal. When you think about the money that it take, took to put the infrastructure to get this place functioning and just the amount of money we've made over the years, um, I would say infrastructure is, unless you're you know drilling 150 feet deep wells or something like that, it's kind of, uh, I, I wouldn't say it's, it's by any means our worst expense. You know, I mean, greenhouses are not really that expensive these days. And you're going to replace them with plastic every few years anyway. So it's not like, you know, it, it's, it's not like too many tears are worth shedding over that. Uh, I've thought about farmers, you know, who are in like less stable situations than us. And, you know, I don't know, maybe getting a, you know, a 40 foot connex and turning half of it into a uh, half of it into a refrigerator and half of it into storage, um, you know, and, and having some kind of semi portable thing um, for farmers that are really concerned about that. But the fact of the matter is, you know, you invest in the land, you invest in your relationships, and you invest in yourself. Um, so I think the best sign for a landowner is people that that are that are willing to help you, but are kind of hands off. Uh, you know, um, I think that what well, you should get worried if you're leasing land when, when your landowner starts getting really particular about things. I think that's a sign that maybe you shouldn't invest anymore in infrastructure and go away. Right. <laughs> but yeah. Yeah. Now, with 15 acres and and 250 CSA members and the farmers markets, can I ask how much you guys are grossing in a year? We're grossing around 250000 a year, and that's okay. been pretty stable for a while. When you guys started, were you thinking 15 acres, 250 members, and and $250,000 a year? So when we started, we were probably like most people that start out, we were very, very ambitious. Um, we started, the first year we started farming eight acres, and we our goal was to have 150 CSA members. I think we got 100 members our first year, which was actually pretty good for first year farming. Um, but we we had some some we had definitely done some cash flow projections because we did a um, the first year we did operating capital loans with the FSA, so we had to actually like go through some different scenarios and and show that you know where the business was going to go in the next few years, and we were definitely had had sales projections that even took us past that. But I think that we hadn't fully like worked out the numbers in our head as to whether that was really realistic or not. Um, 
but and then the second year we farmed 10 acres and then the third year we farmed the full 15 acres and then we've been at the 15 acres since then and it sounds like planning on staying at that level yeah to in order to expand we'd have to take on another property so it's something we've considered but um, at least for this year we're gonna keep it at the 15 acres it's we always go back and forth in our head about expanding and there's so many different ways to expand there's expanding in acreage farming more acreage there's expanding in growing season there's expanding by planting crops that you can sell more of so planting less of things that don't really do that well like for example we used to grow try to grow grow a lot of spinach in the summer it would never do well so By taking that out and then planting more tomatoes or corn, then that's kind of expanding sales because you're going to sell, maybe you can make more money off of tomatoes per bed than you can spinach. So we've tried to, instead of expanding in acreage, we've tried to expand in some of those other like three-dimensional ways. So it's something we think about a lot. One of the things that I thought was interesting when I was researching your farm is that you guys have a full season CSA. I think it's it's 28 weeks. And a lot of other CSAs in that area that I've talked to sell their shares on a monthly basis. Oh, I, I, I'm curious how you came to that decision. Because if you offer people, let's say, how do I describe it? Um, like, for instance, some, some CSAs have a larger box or a smaller box. Um, and people will always pick the smaller box uh, when you offer both. We like people to commit. So there's Farm Fresh U, and then there's Blue Apron and all this stuff, right? And uh, almost all of these 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 organizations are, are doing the month-to-month basis, right? Um, and it kind of creates a casual relationship between the customer and the farm. But if you are farming a full season, you've invested into growing for the full season, there's there's really, for us, we are disincentivized to create a casual relationship. We need a more personal, serious relationship with our customer. So we like it when our customers sign up for the full season. Not to mention, because we're not a year-round CSA, or the 20 weeks, um, it's not quite as big of a commitment as if we, if it was, you know, like a 52-week CSA or 50-week CSA. Um, it, there's, there's not nearly as much of a commitment um, as that, but we want our we like our customers to to do the full season. We uh, we incentivize them to do the full season. Um, so yeah, we do have an option for people to sign up for a four week block, and um, a lot of people do that. People that need the flexibility for going on vacation and but they end up paying more. So the way our pricing for our box works is the full season share they pay twenty four dollars a week. And then we have a half season share, which is for 14 consecutive weeks, and they pay $25 a week. And then we have the four week option, and they pay $25.50 a week. So there, it's it's the same box. The box is exactly the same, but depending on the commitment level, you're going to pay a different price for the same product. So that's one of the ways that we incentivize people to sign up for the whole thing. So if someone does a four-week trial and then they decide they really like it, they're probably going to go for, oh, I'm just going to sign up for the rest of the season because they know they're going to save the money. Um, so we, we really try to get people to sign up for the whole thing. But but we also, being in such a hyper-competitive market with the CSA, having the four-week option is, is really just one of the things we do in order to survive and get people to, to try out our, our box. And I have the impression that San Francisco and the Bay Area in general is a, like you said, a very hyper-competitive CSA marketplace. Yeah, it's serious, and and there's a lot of there's a lot of really really great larger farms that are doing CSAs around here. But then on the flip side of that, there's a lot of uh, produce delivery services that are buying produce in, repackaging it, and sending it out. And there's it's really it can if customers don't know what to look for, it's really hard for them to tell which produce which is an actual CSA coming from a farm and which is just you know someone that's buying things wholesale and repackaging them. And that model of buying things wholesale and repackaging them is um, 
it's no it's no better than the uh than the standard grocery store system you know people want an alternative and that's really why CSAs came about in the first place uh and to watch a lot of companies i would say it's a little disingenuous to advertise yourself as kind of a mom and pop farm agricultural operation uh when actually you're not even really farming um, and so we counter that, uh, w- we still retain our customers and I argue a competitive advantage, um, because one of the things is we actually don't buy in anything from anyone else. Uh, in the eight years that we've done this, we've, we've never bought in a, a single, a single vegetable or anything. Everything that's in the box comes directly from our farm. And that's the promise that we've made and kept to customers. And because of that, uh, we have a short supply chain. So it just goes from the farm directly to people's boxes, essentially. And it doesn't go and sit in, you know, in a, in a freezer, a cooler for three or four days waiting to get repackaged and redistributed. Um, and I argue that that's the competitive advantage. That's how small local farms are going to stay alive. And that's how the local CSA is going to stay alive is by pushing that, that particular advantage and the increased freshness that these other companies just will never be able to get because they have to stop repackage. They have to warehouse the produce. So what have you guys done to market that advantage? Because like you said, it is kind of hard to stand out against somebody who's marketing themselves as a mom and pop operation, putting vegetables in boxes, making that distinction between those folks and a real CSA farm isn't always easy to do. It's, it actually is really hard um, to, to it, it's hard to do it just on the internet. <laughs> but, but one thing is um, like Lily is always putting Facebook pictures up um, and we have a pretty solid Facebook presence. It's one thing. Another thing, uh, you know, we, we have our, uh, we have our strawberry shortcake festival every year where people show up and then I walk them around the farm and point at all the things and kind of reiterate uh, where the produce is coming from. And, but another thing is, and this is kind of a long, there, there's, there's not something with an easy, quick answer. You know what I mean? I can't say that there's a special club of websites that belong to real farmers. <laughs> um, but really what it comes down to, aside from marketing, is actually producing a really fresh product uh, and people getting to know you for that. And that's that's the real marketing that takes a lot of time. And that's where the reputation comes in. And it's just a matter of consistently having a quality product, uh, you know, showing up to deliveries on time, you know, uh, is, is part of it. And just managing the business as well as we can uh, and knowing that we're doing better than, than, than the people warehousing vegetables and knowing that people are coming to us even though they don't necessarily have a choice of a hundred different vegetables to get exact quantity of what they want out of that. Knowing that people are putting faith in us uh, is a sign that people, that we actually do have a really good product and shortening the supply chain truly improves the quality of, uh, of, of produce. And I would add another way that we've gotten a lot of our customers is just getting people that we know to sign up for the CSA box. So I, I grew up in Berkeley. My family still lives there. And starting out our first year, a lot of the people that were CSA members were people that Matt and I personally knew or my mom and dad personally knew, friends of friends. And then just the word of mouth from that. And at our size of about 250 members, it's it's small enough so that there are still a lot of people that we know that are CSA members. And then a lot of them have brought in other people. It's still, there's still people that we've never met before, or I recognize their name on the sign in sheet, but I, I don't know anything about them. But I think that getting beyond the size that we're at, then it, it probably gets harder and harder to be able to differentiate yourself because you have less of a personal connection with each CSA member. With the kind of personal connection that you guys have with your members, what kind of retention rate are you running on your CSA? We probably have to look at the book for that one. I don't know if we've ever actually calculated the retention rate. 
And I think part of the reason that we've never calculated the retention rate is because from year to year, we always kind of hit our our goal for number of CSA members, so we haven't really had And then we to, don't want to think about it anymore. We haven't really had to go through and wonder why we don't have enough members, so it's that's probably why we haven't tried to figure that out. Great. That makes sense. There's no need to, no need to spend time on record-keeping and analysis for measurements that don't do you any good. I, I do think that record keeping is, is always a good idea and it's probably something we should be doing. But <laughs> with this one thing, I guess we kind of dropped the ball. Oh. Well, and it's where I, I put a line between record keeping and analysis, right? I mean, you've got the records. You can, I'm sure you have a way to go back and get that information. It's just a matter that you haven't, it, has, it hasn't been necessary to find it yet. And yeah. that's, I think, I think that's an important distinction for folks when it comes to, when it comes to record keeping, but that's, that's kind of off. Off topic, unless you guys want to talk about record keeping. Um, we keep pretty good records. We keep good records. Tell me about your records. They're good. <laughs> well, so, okay. So, all right. That's great, right? And I and I know that a lot of people, um, a lot of people have a hard time keeping good records. And I mean, ask any organic certification inspector. They're going to say that people's records are lousy for the most part. What? What do you guys do? Do you guys have an overarching strategy about record keeping or is it just something that's come naturally to you? I would say our record keeping is kind of divided up into um, two separate fields. One is just your standard bookkeeping with that we do with QuickBooks with all of our expenses, you know, rent and utilities and payroll, all that stuff. And then there's the uh, record keeping of how much we planted, how much we sold, the different crops, what's bringing in more money than other things. So the first category of the bookkeeping, I think our bookkeeping is really, really, really good. And we've been able to go through, you know, you're comparing different years and really um, identify different categories where we feel like we're spending too much money or like our expenses go up from one year to the next, you know, how can we make that, bring that back down? Um, so each year we try to, at the end of the year, we try to identify maybe three or four categories where we feel like we can save money. And then, um, the next year we, we try to, to actually save some money. So an example of that is, with our merchant account um, for our CSA. So we, we use uh, CSAware, which is a web-based software for our CSA members, so they can pay with a credit card. And our merchant account, one year we kind of realized, hey, we're paying a lot of money for our merchant account. Is there a better thing we can be using? And so we got signed up with a different company, and then we ended up saving like three or $4,000 just by switching over. So just little things like that you can do. Actually, one year we uh, one year we decided to go line by, and we actually do this every year now, we go line by line. Every single cost we incur, we, we go each one, um, and we brainstorm for each one that seems kind of, you know, that we might be able to work on, and we do little strategies for each expense. And we, I mean, we saved, we saved the first year we did that. I mean, we saved so much money because uh, like there's these little inefficiencies, places you can, you're buying stuff in the wrong places, uh, you know, the, the wrong vendor, this, that, or buying too many of something. Uh, and, and it really adds up when you go across your whole budget and examine every single item, even unrelated, um, and add up the savings. And you know, was, that's that's the kind of stuff that I think people really should should be doing at the end of the year, you know, rather than sleeping or you know going on vacation. Yeah. Is probably an advantage too of having a seasonal operation and not choosing to go for that year round business so that you actually have time to pay attention to the management of your, op of your business. Well, that's, yeah, that's the thing. And, and, and I realize we, I think we kind of both realize that going year round actually in a way, I don't know, may, might make us a little bit less competitive uh, because we step away and people miss us for a few months. Um, and, uh, you know, people can experiment with other CSAs and all that stuff. But once the year starts, we're, very fresh uh, and, and and ready to really really hit it hard and make things happen right. You know, I, I would say that for uh, personal burnout is probably just as important for quality 
uh, of produce as anything. You know, if you're tired, burnt out, um, and don't care because you're you're just working too hard, then you're gonna miss out on certain quality control issues. You're gonna let somebody, you know, just so says it's okay. You know what I mean? It, you know, like an employee just if it says, oh, this is okay. It's the difference between actually checking it or just saying, okay, it's okay, uh, and just kind of pushing it pushing it down the line, so to speak, uh, to, to customers. Um, so, yeah, yeah. So it's, it's it's important to take some time off. Although, do we technically probably lose money from taking the, the winters off? Um, there's a lot of time we don't have as much income, uh, but you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of good reasons to go year round. But I think there's a lot of reasons to stay seasonal in most well. We've really kind of gone against the grain in a lot of respects and kind of staying a little more traditional, <laughs> like the, the traditional CSA model. To swing back to to the record keeping, then what are you doing for record keeping out in the field? Do you guys have an electronic solution, or are you primarily paper based? We are all 100% on paper. So for our farmers markets, well, everything we harvest, you know, that is on one set of documents that you know we use as our harvest list, and then we write down how much we harvest, and then. For our farmers markets, we have a load list of what we brought and what we sold, so we can see, you know, what's selling at which market. And then for the CSA, that's pretty much just it's it's a little bit different because when you're trying to figure out what crops are more profitable, then that's one of the one of the ways you can get into a little bit trouble of trouble with the CSA because you're trying to always give people a really good variety of things, but it sometimes it can force you to grow things that are less profitable. Kind of like what I said before about the spinach. We always try to to grow spinach in the summer so we could have a leafy green go in the box, but then we realized we were spending all this time weeding and watering and, and we could just be giving people more tomatoes. So we do go through our farmer's market sales and see, you know, which things sold more, what we could bring more of, um, at the end of the year, that goes into an Excel spreadsheet, and then we figure out what our top crops are, how we can send, sell more of our top crops and less of the crops that don't make a lot of money. So that's, that's pretty much how it goes. And then we also will try to put in more of the high-value items into the CSA boxes and less of the items that um, are less profitable to grow. But that that's kind of a different subject because that has to do with our uh, CSA member survey that we do every year, and and that's more about so what the talk, customers. Why don't we just talk about the CSA member okay. survey? You can talk about the CSA member survey. All right, we have a CSA member survey. It comes down to agriculture is traditionally a production oriented business, meaning people produce things uh, and then they try to sell them after they produce them. I, you know, I mean, you think about you know uh, the corn lobby, for instance. Um, you know, at high fructose corn syrup, there's an example of an entire industry who's based on producing one product and after the fact they figure out how to market it, market it and eventually they came up with high fructose corn syrup. Now that's kind of a, tr- a way that agriculture in a sense has been for a long time um, but more innovative businesses, non-agricultural businesses are, f- are focusing more and more on becoming customer based uh, um, entities that focus, say, on first what does a customer want and then going and producing that. <laughs> um, and so clearly we can't be a completely customer based entity that we have to, there are certain production limitations that we have as vegetable growers. We cannot grow mangoes or, you know, chicken feed or something like that. Um, you know, I guess we could, but not in the way that we want to. Uh, <laughs> so, what we came up with as an answer to this is the Shooting Star CSA member feedback survey where we have a list of every single crop we go, we grow, right? And next to the list, it's on SurveyMonkey, it's on, it's on, it's on the internet. Um, we, we have a list, uh, we have a, a list that says um, they either got too much, just right, or not enough, right? Um, not enough being a one, uh, you know, being, a, I guess, a zero one, and, and, and too much being a three. So not enough being one, just right being two, not being three. And so they, have, they get a numerical value. Um, and so the crops that most people said not enough, that's assigned us that we need to grow 
more of that crop. And crops that people say that they get too much of, that's a sign we need to either grow less of it or completely eliminate it. So we look at the we look at the survey and say, uh, you know, like say bok choy, for instance, uh, you know, if which we don't grow anymore, <laughs> but if everyone in the whole, if, if everybody who took the survey says they got too much bok choy, then it's a sign that people just don't like bok choy, so we eliminate it altogether. Um, so year after year, we've kind of honed our our our, our crops and how much of what we grow of each crop and, and realize kind of what people want um, throughout that. Uh, and really the big lesson is people really like tomatoes and strawberries. <laughs> um, right. You know, uh, people, people just, people love that stuff. So that's how we do it. Um, and, and that is, and, and the cool thing about that survey is it, it directly affects a crop plan, which gives our crop plan a direct link to the needs and desires of the CSA member. Uh, and I think that's, I think that's part of our success because if we kept giving them things that they didn't like or didn't, we didn't know whether they liked it or not, um, then yeah, we have some stuff they like, but without talking to them, and this is the way you can communicate with CSA members once you get above, you know, 20 people. <laughs> um, it's, it's really been an amazing thing. I, I, I believe that, that, uh, the customer feedback is also a reason why we've we can, we've been able to compete in this ridiculous market. And one other thing that the survey really helps with is our we have really wonderful CSA members and they always give us wonderful feedback, but I think that because the survey is anonymous, people feel like they can be a little bit more honest with their likes and dislikes. So it's it's really important for them to have a, a time when they can, you know, say what they actually liked getting in the box and maybe what they didn't really like getting in the box without there's no judgment. They don't have to, like, look us in the eye and tell us that they didn't really like the fennel. They can just do it on the survey. We'll get the information and, and we can adjust from there because, um you know, people, they really, our customers don't, they don't, they know how much hard work we put into everything and, and they wouldn't want to, you know, offend us by saying they didn't like one crop or another, but um, we we just want to know what they think. So this is a good way to, to give them the chance to do that. Are there other questions that you're asking on the survey or do you just focus on a, a thumbs up or thumbs down on each crop? We also ask how they found out about the farm, um, if they feel like the overall box quantity was too much, just right or not enough. We also ask if they had any quality issues throughout the season, and if they did, we want to know exactly what it was. We ask um, about their pickup site, if they had any issues at their pickup site. Uh, we ask if they – we also send it to people who didn't renew. So let's say they did a four-week trial and then they decided not to renew. We want to know why they didn't renew. And then we ask um, if they're planning on signing up again. So we, we kind of do the whole the whole – round of questions and it's it's really been really helpful for us. And is that something you're just doing once a year? Yeah, once a year. And after the CSA season's over. That yeah. is good. You don't want to okay. overload people with this stuff either. Um yeah. you, you kind of there's a certain magical kind of moment I think um, that you can do uh, you know because the last thing people I mean you've seen every single thing you do you get a some kind of feedback survey <laughs> these days uh, and yeah. so so yeah so, so we I, I think there's kind of like responsible email etiquette uh, which is something that people getting into farming should definitely definitely be aware of uh, not to overdo it with their you know if they start with 25 members and they send them emails and stuff every week every or whatever, day. every day <laughs> they're gonna lose customers for that <laughs> yeah <laughs> Yeah. And doing the doing a survey in the middle of the season, we thought about I thought about doing it, but then you get into like the customers don't necessarily know how long it takes for the feedback to translate into what we can actually do in the field. So if they if we do a survey in the middle of the season, we can't really do anything about it until the following year. So it's and then they think, oh, well, I, I told them that I got too much of this, but they didn't do anything about it. So it's just better to have the season be over and then we can start over with the next year. So great. With that, we're going to take a break, get a word from our sponsors, and then we'll be right back with Lily and Matt from Shooting Star CSA out in California. 
The Farmer to Farmer podcast is made possible with the generous support of Vermont Compost Company, makers of Fort V and Fort Light potting mixes for certified organic transplant production. And while it's hard to start thinking now about next year's potting soil in the middle of the current season, you don't want to miss participating in Vermont Compost Company's fall pre-buy program. When you order Vermont Compost potting soil for next year's growing season, you can save significantly on the finest potting soil that I personally have ever used. There are many great options for significant savings. Vermont Compost Company organizes shared truckload weeks when they organize and group orders by state or region. When you place your order to ship on one of these shared truckloads, they offer discounts on the purchase of your potting soil. Plus, they consolidate the orders so growers also save on shipping fees. Now, if you want to get the best possible deal on Vermont Compost Potting Soil, order a full truckload. If you don't need a full truckload yourself, get together with your farming friends and neighbors and order a full truckload together. This option offers the best possible price per sling bag or pallet and the best possible shipping rate. It's also the best option for growers who are a great distance away from Vermont. Growers who pre-buy full truckloads often end up paying a price for their sling bags that is lower than what growers pay for a sling bag picked up in Vermont. The fall pre-buy program runs September 21st to December 21st. For more information, visit the website vermontcompost.com. Bandwidth for the Farmer to Farmer podcast is brought to you by BCS America. BCS two-wheel tractors are often mistaken for just a rototiller, but it's a truly superior piece of farming equipment. Engineered and built in Italy where small farms are a way of life, BCS tractors are built to standards of quality and durability expected of real agricultural equipment, the kind of dependability every farm needs. I've worked with BCS tractors for over 24 years, and I wouldn't consider anything else for my small tractor needs. And I'm not the only fan. More than 1.5 million people in 50 countries have discovered the advantages of owning Europe's most popular two-wheel tractor. And these really are small tractors with the kinds of features found on their four-wheeled cousins and a wide array of equipment. Power harrows, rotary plows, flail mowers, snow throwers, sickle bar mowers, chippers, log splitters, and more. Check out bcsamerica.com to see photos and videos of BCS in action. bcsamerica.com. And we're back with Lily and Matt from Shooting Star CSA out in Fairfield, California. So I think we had a good conversation about marketing in the first half of the show. Tell me a little bit about how things work out in the field for you guys. 15 acres, how are you guys managing those crops? Matt, you want to take this one? Uh, weed, water, and sell. Weeding, tell me how that works. Well, Tell me how that works on your operation. It's definitely been... Uh an evolutionary process. I think before farming, uh, t- before Lynn and I farmed together, I remember watching weeds grow and saying, I don't need to weed them because they're small. They're too small. Um, and then they got big really quick. Uh, and so from there, we are like in our beds. Uh, we really, really make sure every every weed that we can get gets got. Uh, and you can't really do that all by hand. I mean, some people could, but I think we would probably go broke if we just did it all by hand. Um, and so we started with uh, getting a Farmall 140 tractor, which is a tractor built. This one was built in 1962. Uh and it has a belly bar with blades that go in between the crops. And so that was a tremendous help. Uh, and we operated with farm malls for, I think, six, six and a half years, uh, you know, working, uh, you know, weeding around stuff with blades and sweeps and things like that until uh, Nigel at Eatwell Farms recommended that we uh, get a finger weeder which essentially uh, is a implement that the, the tractor the pull goes behind the tractor and there's a little steering wheel on the implement. So you sit on the implement on a steering wheel and you have these little rubber fingers um, that push a soil around the plants and take out uh, really nearly every, nearly all the weeds. If you get them at the right size, you can you can get weeds even in between the plants. And the finger weeder actually does a better job than than human beings with hula hose. Uh, and so it's one of those disruptive technologies that uh, we, we believe everybody's going to eventually have it. Um, and so, but right now, because we're on the cusp, we're some of the first people, the first farmers to get it um, get, and start using the finger weeder. We feel like we're kind of at an advantage, at least for a little while, until everybody else catches up. And one of the things that 
that has made the mechanical cultivation possible on the farm is we have a very standardized bed system. So we're on a 60-inch bed, and then um, every bed can be set up to do three rows per bed. Depending on the crop, we'll either do three rows, two rows, or one row per bed, but it's all the exact same bed shaper, um, and then we can run all the same equipment over the beds. So that's really, really, really important if you're going to be doing mechanical cultivation to have this standardized bed system. So we're one of the things that um, we really learned over the years is we don't, if we have to move blades around, um, you know, for different uh, spacing on crops and for mechanical cultivation, we just won't mechanically cultivate. So that's, we, we know that about ourselves. So we always just keep all the tractors are always set up to be able to weed whatever bed they need to weed all the time. And bed shaping um, and having a really uniform shaped bed. Uh, for years and years and years, farmers told me this, and I said, yeah, whatever. Uh, and, 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 and I guess really eventually once we realized just how good it gets when you have a uniform a uniform bed that looks really good and is, is, is totally flat uh, and straight, it, it it really is a game changer, um, and it just makes farming so much easier um, to have really good, solid, uniform, nice built-up beds. So I mean, it's kind of, it's it's one of those things you can't you know it I oh it, I try to explain it to people and it's been tried to and people try to explain it to me over the years, but experience is almost like the only way that you really figure out how important it is to have really good beds. Because the first thing to say is, oh, well, the plants will grow whether it's on a perfect bed or clubby soil. That is true. Whether it's a perfect or kind of funny looking bed, plants will grow, but they'll grow with weeds. And it's all about weed management and even watering and things like that. So you guys are using a raised bed system. I guess, yeah, you could, say, you could sort of say that. I mean, it's just, I wouldn't call it super high raised, but it's just, a, a, I call it a bed system, <laughs> like four so, inches up above the ground, something like that. Okay, so you're using something to kind of shape, and it's got, it's got, it's got a definite raised section and then shoulders to it. Yeah, you could say that. Okay, what kind of equipment are you using to establish those beds? We uh, we, we use a, a rototiller with a bed shaper on it, along with uh, lister bars, uh, and then we and yeah, and that's pretty much it. Um, and we do a lot of cover cropping in the winter to break up any hard pen. And I suppose that's another advantage of not growing crops in the winter time is that what as you're pulling those crops out in the fall, you're able to put cover crops in, and then you've got a good what four to six months of time where in your climate things are actually growing yes that, that, that is correct um so yeah we, we we give we give the we give the field a break break essentially <laughs> we're not driving the tractors around quite as much during those times and with the 15 acres that you're farming is every acre getting cropped every year or do you guys have enough room where you're able to rotate things out for a year at a time it's it's all getting cropped every year, and there's some sections that get two crops in one year. So we're definitely pushing the limits of, of the land that we're on. So we, we always have, um, like this time of year, we're always planting into an area that that already got planted into. It's, you know, it's been fallow and disked um, a couple times, but then uh, when we need the space, we got to replant. But then it gets cover cropped and it doesn't get planted again until the next year. So it's, it usually works out pretty good. But, I mean, we dream about having enough space to be able to, uh, even do summer cover cropping or not have to double crop anything, but it just, it, it's, it's not really realistic on the size that we're at right now. So what are you doing to supplement your fertility beyond what the cover crops are providing? We do, so every year we do soil tests and then based on the soil test, we add compost, we've added gypsum depending on what the soil test says and um, other other supplements such as uh, soft rock phosphate, sulfate of potash, and then so that the compost gets blended with the gypsum and any other supplements that we're adding. Um, and then in the spring, once a year, we have there's a local compost company and they have spreader trucks, so they'll blend that stuff all together and they load it up into their spreader trucks, drive to the farm, 
and then they drive around the farm, all the compost and everything gets spread out, and then we disc that in. So that's, like, the first thing that we do. And then every bed, as we're making beds, we have a fertilizer spreader that um, – it's like a precision spreader. So as we're listing beds, we put down 250 pounds per acre of pelleted fertilizer. It comes out. It comes out to like six pounds, six pounds a bed or something like that. About around six pounds a bed, five and a half pounds actually exactly per per, per 150 foot long bed of uh, of this uh, Cal Organic uh, 757, um, which is seven uh, percent nitrogen, five percent phosphorus and then seven percent potassium uh, excuse me yeah yeah so, so so potash excuse me uh so yeah so there it is um and so it's a seven five seven we, we put down um it's fun to do with a precision fertilizer spreader because before we would just do with a regular you know upside down cone spreader and we could never get it right um i think we've saved a lot in fertilizer since we've uh gotten more more precise uh you know which is just it, it just feels good to do do things get it right and it's great to use the soil test uh we really like soil tests we uh we did a we actually did a soil test project in Dominican Republic a few years ago um and so we're really into the soil test and what it can do in terms of just understanding getting a some of an idea of what's going on in your in your in your field um cuz you can't really know what to put in before you you know before you look essentially and that's how we well, that's how we check and it sounds like most of your production is being done outdoors. Are you guys doing crops undercover? It's all outdoor production. We do have greenhouses, but those are for the transplants, like the little starts. So those are just, you know, plants on tables and trays, and then everything else is outside. Yeah, why uh, why do greenhouse production in, in sunny California, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, I you guys do kind of have it made out there. Um, and and I think from the pictures that I saw, you're farming on pretty flat ground. Uh, yes, yes. we That was one of our stipulations because we both were farming on hills. Um, I can remember watching a, uh, a bulldozer that I was operating, um, you know, hauling, haul, cruising down a hill um, with no driver in it and me run, having to run up and grab it and hit the brakes and everything like that and jump on a moving bulldozer. So after that, I said, uh, you know, and, and Lily had some issues farming on hills too. It's just so much nicer to farm on flat land. It's easier to weed. Everything about flat land is, is just – Flatland is great for farming, <laughs> and it's worth it to lease. I'd rather lease than farm on flat land than buy some cliff of marginal land and try to farm that. You know what I mean? Well, and I, I think it goes back to what you said about managing somebody else's farm. I think, you know, when if you've worked on a flat farm and you've worked on a hilly farm, it becomes pretty easy to decide what you want for your own operation. Yeah, and not to mention your some of the infrastructure investments, you make that money back in in growing in 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 production when you actually farm on on a, a good piece of land, even if you have the risk of getting of getting kicked off or having to go somewhere else. Uh, it's farming a good piece of land, even for a few years, uh, financially, I think is worth it, even if you end up sinking some money into it. So for transplant production, how important is that with the long season that you have? It's it's very, very important. We grow all our own plants. So we're in the spring, we have two greenhouses fully loaded with little plants, and then we have plants going all the way until right now we have some of our last plants that are ready to go out, like lettuce. So we're the greenhouse is a big part of the operation, and um, it's pretty complex because we have – all the succession plantings of tomatoes and peppers and lettuce and all the different crops that we grow. So the the greenhouse is a really, really big part of the operation, especially in the spring. So January, February, March, a lot of, a lot of stuff going on in the greenhouses. What kind of containers are you guys using for growing your plants? We mostly use, um, they're like hard plastic trays. I think they're 341 plantel trays. So the cells are pretty small. And then for peppers and tomatoes, we use the 72 cell trays, the softer trays. Um, one of the things about the mechanical cultivation is that having transplants that are really nice and healthy and, and big is 
becomes really, really important because um, the bigger they are, the deeper you can go with any of the cultivation. So we're we're pretty obsessed with getting good transplants out of, coming out of the greenhouse. And what kind of transplant are you using to get things out in the field? Uh, it's a uh, I think it was built by Mennonites. Uh, it's a uh, Rainflow. Is the name of the water? It's a Rainflow water wheel transplanter. Um, okay. And it's uh, yeah, it's it's all essentially it's this it's a very simple um, machine, but it works very well. It's three wheels with spikes in them with seats behind it. So you just sit down and you you still people are still physically pushing the plants into the ground, uh, but rather than crawling on the ground and having to be super athletes, they just kind of sit there and, and push the plants in. So it's um, it, it works pretty well. And are you using that as a water wheel, or are you just dibbling and then putting just, irrigation on afterwards? We're dibbling and putting irrigation afterwards. We have a clay soil, the classification of soil, sil- silty clay loam, the sycamore silty clay loam, which means that water wheeling is just kind of unrealistic. It, the, the, the water wheel just picks up all kinds of sticky, muddy clay. Um, and so the best way to do it is to, yeah, just to run the, run the, run it dry and then um, put irrigation on its cook as we can. Now, irrigation is obviously something that's really important to you guys. You're farming in the Central Valley of California. It doesn't rain in the summertime. So how are you getting your water out on the fields? It's all drip. Uh, we, we use complete. Our system right now is all drip irrigation. Uh, we've thought about going to sprinklers, and you know, maybe one day we will. Uh, it's it's just the the time just hasn't simply hasn't been right. We've been, but by the time it finally gets we get started into into it, uh, we're, we're usually we're just always using drip. Uh, and so you know, we just pull the tea tape out and, and and rock it. And we have a a filter that does about a two hundred two hundred mesh filter that that uh. That that filters really well. Um, it's a, it's a vac clean filter where it has a little vacuum cleaner inside of the filter. So when the pressure goes low in the system, it tells the filter to clean itself. Um, so it's been the most amazing thing ever, actually. Um, you know, so yeah. So so that's so the water has worked. The water is one of the things that has been really actually great for us uh, in these times of uh, water peril. Uh, we've actually. Being in Solano County has been just a really wonderful thing. Uh, we we couldn't have gotten luckier with that, to be honest. <laughs> you guys haven't had the same drought effect that everybody else has had. Well, I wouldn't say every. You know, I think there's a lot of. I, I wouldn't say. I don't think it's safe to. I can't really say. I don't think everyone has been hit by the drought, uh, but definitely down south, um, and so there's a lot of places where people really have. Um, but I don't think every single farmer has been affected as as farmers would like everyone to believe. <laughs> <laughs> It's not so. It's it's not how it looks from here in the Midwest. I mean, you know, the worst. It's always the worst stories that make the, the headlines. Uh, but 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 agriculture is not dead in California. It's it's still happening. You know, <laughs> it's still it's still happening. We're, we haven't we have no we haven't all moved to cactus farms. You know what I mean? Okay. I hear that prickly prayer is a pretty good crop. Uh, I'm sure it is. Uh, if you want to eat them six times a week, maybe I'll start growing them. <laughs> do you guys do any mechanical harvest or is everything still being handled by hand? Every, we harvest everything by hand. Yeah. Yeah, definitely by okay. hand. Harvesting takes up most of the time, you know, most of everyone's time around here. Yeah, we're too, we're, I would say we're probably too small to really get serious into mechanical harvesting because you have, well, you'd have to, we're not that we're too small. It's a, that, that, you know, we have 35 different crops. Would that mean like 35 different machines to harvest each different crop? Your your 15 acres, um, I mean, you talked about how important quality was. Can you tell us a little bit about how you get product harvested and back to the packing shed and what happens to it once it gets back to the shed? So a big part of our quality control is growing crops that are really, really healthy. And if we can do that well, then it makes quality control a lot easier. So as cr- crops are, the way we organize our harvest is Things that are leafy get harvested earlier in the day when it's still cool out. Um, they lettuce and kale and chard and that kind of stuff will get dunked into cold water. And then if it's going to the farmer's market, it gets 
packed into, we have these plastic box liners, so the leafy things go into the plastic box liner in a tray. Um, if it's just going to the CSA, then, then we put it in our walk-in cooler until it's ready to pack boxes. And then um, pretty much everything goes into the walk-in cooler except for tomatoes, onions, winter squash. So, you know, we're always moving things really quickly from the field into the walk-in cooler. And because we're, we're only 15 acres, um, it, it doesn't really take hours and hours to harvest any one crop. So things aren't sitting out in the field more than like, you know, 45 minutes or an hour ever and before they go into the walk-in cooler. And if they are, they're in, we have a, a harvest truck with a shell on the back. So it's, everything's in the shade. We're, we're really, we're really obsessed with, with keeping things cool especially when you, you spend all this time, you know, planting and weeding and watering the crops. You want to make sure that your, that your harvest and post-harvest is really squared away also. Um, crops like carrots, things that need to be washed. We have a, a wash table with a spray hose where we can wash them down, and then they get packed into trays and put in the walk-in cooler. There's nothing, uh, I mean, there's nothing rocket science-y about it, uh, really. It's pretty, it's pretty simple, uh, but following tenants of, you know, washing stuff, getting into the cooler quickly, and then getting into the customer as quickly as possible, uh, you know, following that tenants, you can really, really, really outcompete the larger organizations on quality. Uh, you know, without having to, really without having to invest that much as long as you keep, again, keeping your supply chain short is the, is, is really the key to this whole thing. Right. It, both short in number of steps that it takes to get to the customer, but also short in terms of the amount of time that it takes to get to the customer. That is correct. Yeah, and we, we really don't like to have things sitting around in the walk-in cooler. So tomatoes, for example, those all get harvested um, like the day before each market. So we're during tomato season, we're harvesting on, you know, let's see, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, um, just to get tomatoes out to the markets and to the into the CSA on the right day because, you know, even just – especially when it's hot out, you know, even just sitting around an extra day in the barn is, like, the difference between having a tomato that's going to get to the customer in really, really good shape or having a tomato that when it gets to the customer it's going to be a little bit uh, – it'll still be really good but a little bit um, banged up. So we're – and we're just really into um, – not not having produce sit around. That that's something that you can get into if you don't um if you have a lot of overproduction is you harvest a lot, maybe you don't sell it all and then you end up having produce that sits around and you still have fresh stuff coming in but you it's like the um first in, first out. You don't really want to have you want to have last in, first out with your produce. Yeah, and you really complicate your life when you have that kind of overproduction and yeah. have, or trying to trying to stretch out your inventory. Um, really can I don't know. I, I, I it's a death spiral. Yeah, you know, it just it gets harder and harder and harder, and it's not something that's self correcting. Yeah. <laughs> uh. Yeah, so I mean planting less is like such a such a wonderful thing when you when you let go of that insecurity and I dare I say ego of wanting to have a certain number of beds of tomatoes, you know what I mean, and wanting to look at some huge tomato field when really once once we really understand what you can actually move, um planting less is like it's like awesome. <laughs> it it solves so many problems by by not over <laughs> yeah, I would say uh, maybe like year four or five, we we just we kind of realized that we had a lot of overproduction with certain crops, and we just sat down, you know, line by line, crop by crop, and we were like, okay, what can we cut out? And we cut out so much stuff; it was amazing. And the next year, it was like it, it just felt so different because we weren't running around, you know, taking care of all these crops that we knew we weren't gonna be able to harvest and sell. So it's just just really identifying the areas of overproduction for us was, was very important. And then as time goes on, it's easier for us to see what we have overproduction of. So we're, we're always fine-tuning that. So how many employees does it take to run your operation? We have about four employees when we add up like our part-time and full-time people that we have here. 
So four employees plus us, and then we have you know people that help us out at the farmers market too. So yeah, we're we're pretty bare bones operation here. It's 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 a it's a perennial skeleton crew. Uh, labor is 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 the is California's big big issue these days for agriculture. Um, there's there's a lot of uh, you know I think vegetables are kind of at the bottom of the of, of the end of the line when it comes to getting good labor. Um, you have construction trades and vineyards, and then um, you know guys waiting at Home Depot for random people wanting to do housework uh, and you know like yard work and stuff like that. And so we're kind of at the end of the line when it comes to that. Um, and so you know, so so we kind of. Uh, it's uh it's it's required us to be efficient, more efficient than probably we ever imagined. <laughs> um, you know, to try to have the right 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 bit of labor, and also the people who we hire. Um, really, uh, it's it, it's important to have quality people. Uh, but what's even better than having a really uh, like perfect you know Rambo of a worker is having somebody who just shows up uh, day after day and year after year uh, consistency is is like I'd, I'd rather have a consistent mediocre person than somebody who's amazing but you don't know if they're going to show up or not you know what I mean uh, exactly um, and so that's been kind of uh, you know that's 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 something that uh, you know labor's right now especially with the recession the not really being around as much um it's it's kind of you know there were times there were people you know who were applying who had experiences is like head chefs and stuff like that applying I mean the recession was great in that respect for an employer you had all kinds of really great people <laughs> desperate for work uh, but 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 now people now people figure out how to be you know locked into their jobs and us being a seasonal farm uh, it did. That's the hardest thing about being a seasonal farm is uh, is, is retain, retaining labor. Yeah. We do have a couple of people that have come back, you know, for – we've had one or two people that have been with us for four or five years now. So that's been really good. But we're always – every year we have new people coming on. So. And every year it's, there's the question, are we going to are we gonna have enough workers, uh, you know? And so that's, that's the – I would say – I would say that's an even greater and more important issue than water out in California, to be honest, for a lot of farmers. So, Matt, one of the things I wanted to ask you about uh, when when you read the articles that are out there about Shooting Stars Farm, something that comes up consistently is that you're a veteran. Um, I, I think it's interesting that you're a military veteran and you also served in the Peace Corps. Can you tell me a little bit about how your history in, in both of those areas of service influenced your life on the farm? Let's see. Um, yeah. Uh, it's nice to be, I guess, well-rounded after you, you know, do the run around with a rifle for a little while and then you, you know, want to run around um, doing with, with absolutely no weapons at all. Uh, I guess uh, it, it's hard to, I don't want to get the story misconstrued as one of, um, you know, a, a walk from, from war goingness to peace goingness or anything like that because it's just such a kind of it, it's, I realize people it kind of pulls people's heartstrings a little bit um, you know the fact that I did both of those things uh, and I don't want to give people the impression that it, that it, I don't want people to give ammo for whatever political beliefs they hold I think they should just have those on their own um, but yeah so I, I did uh, I was in in Iraq in 2003 I was an infantryman before that I served in Korea as an infantryman uh, and so I did four years active army it was actually kind of a wild time from 2001 to 2005 to be in the military, there was a lot going on. It was pretty exciting, really. <laughs> um, a little too exciting for me. Um, but uh, out there in Iraq, it was pretty. It was. It was. Um, there was. It was. It was a lot more of an. Agri there's a lot of agricultural communities, a lot of gardens and things like that. And so, um, seeing that was really kind of 
interesting for me because cause I hadn't really, you know, like I had never been in a chicken coop uh, before I was running through one looking for weapons and people, you know, trampling through chicken coops and, and things like that. So it was, it was really kind of a exposure to agriculture that I really hadn't had previously. I'm from a suburb in Albuquerque, so that's, uh, so, so, so we didn't really see there's nothing growing out there <laughs> for the most part. Uh, and then afterwards i really got into you know i just got into the idea of sustainability and and and, and farming and i wanted to spend more time in i want to spend more time in nature uh you know it really the army was a little less time in that kind of you know n- natural environment than I, I thought uh because you know more and more people are living in urban environments uh so more and more wars are going to happen in urban environments as well so it's just you, you know we've got a lot of time in nature don't get me wrong i got to do a lot of really fun stuff in nature mostly training uh and so so i wanted to just kind of i, I wanted to kind of i guess be free i guess everybody i think everybody who's in the military goes with through a certain time in their lives when they just kind of imagine just being able to do what they wanted to for a little while usually people go on leave and get it out of their system and then and then come on back uh but me i i really i kind of wanted to see i i felt like i saw a decent amount of the world through the army and uh i kind of wanted to see it through my kind of on my own terms as well uh, and so then I, you know, got into got into farming. Ended up uh, volunteering in Hawaii. Um, and when I was in Hawaii, uh, the, the farm uh, the farm that I was volunteering at, um, uh, she got a. Uh, a printout from the Hawaiian Organic Farmers Association about the Center for Agroecology and Sustainable Food Systems, which is a six-month training program in Santa Cruz. Um, and I applied, and uh, I think it was a little less competitive than that then because I don't know, I don't think they let me in now <laughs> because there's so many candidates now. But but I got lucky, um, and they they let me in, and uh, and that's where I met. Where that's where Lily and I met, and I ended up uh, from there. I ended up applying to the Peace Corps. And I had, didn't have any, didn't even have any college uh, when I. By the time I went to the Peace Corps, it was all on just kind of agricultural stuff that I had learned, um, and so they let me in. And, and Niger was pretty, pretty, pretty amazing because uh, you know it was just, it, it was great just to see. I felt like with the army, I saw people kind of trying to live, uh, but it was, but, but it, I didn't really get to absorb it the way I really wanted to, because we were too busy with missions and patrols and and things like that. And we we were always there's always something going on when I was in in Iraq uh, that perhaps created a little too much stress for me, really, really to see the culture. Um, but, but going to Niger and and being able to live with people and live with live in you know the whole live in the mud hut experience i got that uh and that was really i think that was really good for me um because it went from such i went from this a really really fast paced environment of the army in a kinetic situation um in the infantry to um kind of this more slow paced uh peace corps lifestyle uh and i and i really am grateful to have had such a so so different experiences um than Came back to uh, California in 2009, and that's when uh, that's when the serious vegetable farming started. And I ended up going back in the reserve uh, while I was while I was farming here at Shooting Star CSA, and served for three years uh, in the uh, Civil Affairs uh, Civil Affairs Battalion, which is uh, it was the Army Reserve uh, Civil Affairs. Um, the program, the 445th, uh, and it was out of Mountain View, California, and it was just, and that was totally fun too because I got to learn about disaster relief, um, and I feel like in the infantry side of, of, of the military, it was it was all about getting the bad guy, you know what I mean? Um, and civil affairs, we learned a lot more about using. Uh, about about the civilian population, and they realize you can't really win a war um, without the support of the civilian population. It's it's just impossible. So civil affairs is dedicated really to getting the support of the civilian population. And my agricultural side, I think, helps me out with that. Um, and Peace Corps as well. Um, but after that, I ended up. Uh, I, I have a lot of hobbies. 
after that, I, I, I decided, uh, I decided to get out because I wanted to go to college, uh, and I really wanted to dedicate, uh, enough time to finally get my master's degree. So that's, that's, it's, it was, it was really a, a rough decision to get out of, uh, the, the reserve civil affairs. I miss it every day. Um, but, Right now, I'm pursuing a master's degree in international agricultural development, along with farming. So, um, wow, yeah. So, you know, you know, I got a night school. I did, I did my bachelor's night school. Uh, you know, while we were farming as well, uh, and so, so Lily's been really supportive in, in helping that out. And you know, I think it's good to say that that if I didn't have the the solid you know, this, this solid foundation of farming and farming out here, I wouldn't have been able to do, you know, to, to, to kind of, you know, achieve my, my bucket list of all the, all the, all the little side projects, all the things that I felt like I had just never had time to do before I started farming. I feel like just by, I mean, you can't farm at night, you know what I mean? So you, you can, you might as well go to school. Uh, if, 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 you know, if you haven't gone to school already. So uh, it was really, I got an education, not only in business, in, in, in the business of farming, but I got a business management bachelor's degree and then pushing this other stuff. So anyways. Lily, now I've gone and done, I think what is almost the default in our culture when, when you've got a couple who's farming. And I've asked Matt about his experience and he spent some time talking about that. What about you? I You don't, you don't show up as much in in the press. Yeah, I guess when you uh, when you don't uh, when you're not like a war hero, you don't get quite as much attention. <laughs> and that's not right, to be honest. That's really not right. Um, so I, I grew up in Berkeley, uh, gardening with my family, and then I went to UC Santa Cruz. And when I when I was in college, I decided that. Uh, being a farmer was something I wanted to do as a career. So, you know, over the summer, I, I had a few summer farming jobs. I took time off to do like a full season apprenticeship on a farm in California. And then I just um, started working on farms after that. So I've just really, before we started this farm, I tried to be exposed to as many different operations as possible. And I, I also studied abroad in um, in Chile and South America and did some agronomy classes down there. And that was really interesting to um, study more the conventional agriculture side of things. Um, it was really, really interesting because I feel like there's so much of a um, – in some of the organic farming community, it's a lot of like us versus them as far as um, organic versus conventional agriculture. And that's really not an opinion that I, that I agree with because I feel like, you know, farmers are farmers and we really, really, really need to stick together. So um, having the the background in conventional agriculture really helped me um, learn about some of that stuff. And yeah, I'm just, I'm, I'm kind of more the behind the scenes person. Matt's, Matt's definitely got the more extroverted personality. Um, so it's just, you know, kind of how, kind of how it works out. So with that, we're going to turn to our lightning round. Lily, what's your favorite tool on the farm? Favorite tool on the farm is definitely the finger weeder. That machine has really, really changed our lives and, um, I think it's a great tool, and I, I hope that um, other farmers out there can have the chance to try it out. It's really been great for us. Matt, are you going to say the same thing if I ask you the same question? Uh, my favorite tool on the farm is the grease gun. Tell us about the grease gun. It's a, a little pumpy grease gun that greases up every single implement, um, and if you don't grease up your implements, they will eventually grind down and break on you. So it's my favorite of that. What's your favorite crop to grow, Matt? I would say my favorite crop to grow is probably potatoes. That's not something that I think of as a typical California crop. Uh, well, they they grow all kinds of places. They even grow in South America here. Um, but uh, <laughs> they, yeah, no, uh, it's it's just a great it's, it's just a fun crop to grow. They shoot right up off out of the ground, and you know you you throw dirt over them, and they're just they're just great. They're just fun crop to grow. What's your favorite variety of potato? Oh gosh, uh, that's a rough one. Probably Nicola. Yeah, that's a really good one. How about you, Lily? What's your favorite crop to grow? Uh, probably number one is tomatoes. I love to eat tomatoes. I love all the different varieties. Our customers love tomatoes. There's just 
it's like even with the different varieties of tomatoes, it, it's all there's like never a dull moment with the tomatoes. And we grow a lot of tomatoes here. We sell a lot of tomatoes. So yeah, I'm I'm really all about the tomatoes. And Lily, if you could go back in time and tell your beginning farmer self one thing, what would it be? I think uh, I would I would tell myself to listen to Matt more because I'm the kind of person that I will like I I have a hard time stop when to stop working at the end of the day when there's more things that need to be done. I just want to go 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 and you know work till I die. And and Matt is the kind of person that you know when it's time to be done, it's time to be done and the rest of the tasks can be done another time. And so I, I think the first couple of years it was, I really had to uh, learn how to be disciplined and not work myself to death. So I'm, I think I would have tried to work a little bit less. So Matt, do you guys actually put a definite end time on things? Yeah. Oh yeah. Um, we don't, we don't work past four unless something really bad happens. Wow. And we uh, this year we instituted the five day work week. So we um, we work we actually work uh, Thursday through Monday and then we take Tuesday and Wednesday off. And the reason we do that is because we have our farmers markets on the weekends. So in the past, we've tried to always take Sundays off plus some other day. But, you know, we always have an employee working for us that's at the farmers market and we're on call. And so, you know, we always, we can't really go in and do something without having our cell phone right there. And so now, uh, Tuesday and Wednesday, no one's working on the farm. It's just like pure relaxation. It's, it's really kind of changed our lives having two days in a row where we can just relax. So it's, 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 uh, it's been a long time coming and it, it was really hard to figure out, but now that we've figured it out, it's, it's pretty great. Matt, if you could go back in time until your beginning farmer self one thing, what would it be? Listen to Lily more. Do you want to comment on that? Nope. Thanks, Matt. <laughs> 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 All right. Well, Matt and Lily, thank you so much for being on the Farmer to Farmer podcast. All right. Thanks for having us. Thanks a lot. All right, so wrapping things up here, I'll say again that this is episode 88 of the Farmer to Farmer podcast, and you can find the notes for this show at farmertofarmerpodcast.com by looking on the episodes page or just searching for Shooting Star. That's S-H-O-O-T-I-N-G-S-T-A-R. Remember, you can support the show by going to farmertofarmerpodcast.com slash donate. I want to make the best farming podcast in the world, and you can help. Whether you're supporting the show at farmertofarmerpodcast.com slash donate, shopping at Amazon through the link at farmertofarmerpodcast.com slash Amazon, or showing us your love by leaving us a review on iTunes or Stitcher. Your support matters. Thank you. You can get the show notes for every Farmer to Farmer podcast in your box by signing up for my email newsletter at farmertofarmerpodcast.com or at purplepitchfork.com. Finally, I appreciate so much all of the guest suggestions I received through the suggestions form on farmertofarmerpodcast.com. Please let me know who you would like to hear from. I'll do my best to get them on the show. Thank you for listening. Be safe out there and keep the tractor running. Farmer to Farmer.